Dr. Havde. There are some seats at the front for people who are standing in the back. You don't need to be shy. You can come on up and uh, grab a seat. I want to make sure everybody is comfortable before Dr. Moore starts. So our next speaker and our keynote tonight is Dr. James Moore, who is the principal from the Advanced Planning Group of Jacobs. As has been mentioned in a few of the remarks tonight, last year we had the director of CARFA, or the Caribbean Public Health Agency, speak. And he started off by looking around the room and asking the question, where are the architects? Where are the developers? Where are the teachers? Where, and he went through the list. And the point that he was making is that we really need to focus on a multi-sectoral approach to achieving our national goal of health and well-being for all in the Cayman Islands. And so, as has been mentioned, the planning committee took it to heart. And I, of course, with my background in planning in particular, thought, aha, here is an opportunity to get a subject on the agenda that maybe we can get some other people in the room, attract some new blood, some new crowds. So I'm really excited tonight to have Dr. Moore here to make his presentation. James Moore has over 25 years of professional experience in architecture, community planning, urban design, and redevelopment consulting. He promotes an integrated and comprehensive approach with an overall goal of balancing the physical development of the built and natural environment with sustainable economic growth and continual socio-cultural advancement. He has particular expertise in organizing and managing complex urban redevelopment projects, and he's worked on projects throughout the United States as well as in South America, Asia, Australia, and the Middle East. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and also holds degrees from MIT, including an MS in real estate development. From 1988 to 2000, he taught in the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of South Florida, and he has also taught at MIT, RPI, and Penn. A licensed architect, certified planner, and lead AP, James is active in the US with AIA, APA, CNU, and ULI. See, if you think the healthcare um, community has a lot of acronyms, you should see what planners and architects have. He is the current chair of ULI's Urban Revitalization Council, and he's participated actively in their Building Healthy Places initiative, and is currently participating in the subsequent Healthy Corridors initiative. He lectures and writes regularly on the planning and design of communities, urban redevelopment, sustainability, and related topics. And tonight, Dr. Moore is going to speak to us about designing communities for health and wellness. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Moore. Are we good? We're good, all right. I find that I can think a little better if I can move around a little bit. So um, thank you all for, for having me. Uh, it's been quite wonderful. Um, if my medical qualifications don't seem quite up to snuff, my wife is actually a radiologist. <laughs> and if you want sort of innovation in the medical field, she is what's known as a teleradiologist, where she actually can read films from anywhere. Everything is done via the internet. And so she is actually sitting in our home in Colorado right now, reading films for really across the, across the United States. So the technology is advancing. It allows for some interesting opportunities. Um, but what I'm going to talk about tonight, I think, is maybe not so much cutting edge as looking back and saying, were well, there some good ideas that maybe we should take a look at again and bring them forward? Uh, this idea of designing communities for health and wellness is clearly an emerging trend. I mean, we, I go to meetings and the diversity of the people in the audience is amazing because health resonates with just about everyone, regardless of your academic background or your professional background. A um, couple, couple things. When we say designing, we're talking about every aspect. Planning, designing, construction, the, you know, the architecture, the permitting, all of that. It's really about how do you build a, a, a good community. Community is the totality. It's everything you see around you. It's buildings, it's infrastructure, it's natural environment. And health and wellness cuts across the grain as well. Obviously, physical health is very important, but we'll talk about mental health. I mean, can the built environment help reduce stress, perhaps? We know it can increase stress, but can it actually reduce stress? Um, emotional well-being, feeling connected to your community, that's an important aspect to it. So we're taking a very broad view of all three of these, of these terms. In, in terms. 
Um, I also recognize that we're a little bit behind schedule, and I am the only thing that stands between you and the cocktail reception. <laughs> and we've all read and heard that at least one glass of red wine every day is good for your heart. So um, I will endeavor to move quickly so that we can, we can get out and enjoy a, a libation together. Um, Famous quote attributed to Winston Churchill. I'm not sure I can find the exact reference, but it's a good one regardless. We shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. I think by extension, we shape our communities, thereafter they shape us. And what I'm going to talk to you about is the relationship between the communities we live in and the impact they have on us and what we might be able to do about it. Um, this is not an explicit design presentation, you know, how wide should a sidewalk be, because that's another whole lecture entirely. We'll be here until Saturday just talking about that. But I'll touch on those subjects and I'll give you some references if you do want that additional information. So um, we're going to take sort of a, a bit of an overview and hone in on a couple, of, a couple of key issues. Are we working here? Okay, there we go. We've all seen some variant of this particular graph. It talks about obesity rates. The United States, the obesity rate in 1972 was about 13%. It is more than double that now. And it's not just the US problem. You can see Mexico, Australia, Canada, in all these countries, obesity rates have been going up. So it's clearly, they call it an epidemic. It's clearly an issue. And while you know, obesity in and of itself may not be a health condition, it does indicate other conditions that we are very, very concerned about. So we, we've all seen this information. Obesity in children is skyrocketing. I think we understand that, but what's interesting is that the speaker is actually comes from Shanghai in China. So again, it's not a necessarily even a Western issue. It is a global issue, uh, really throughout, certainly throughout the developed world. You see the information on the various challenges. People don't get enough of fruits and vegetables. One in four young adults is too overweight to even serve in the military, which um, you know, is, a, is, a bit, is a bit staggering. Uh, very recent, set screen addiction is taking a toll on children, and obviously we think in terms of attention span and attention deficit disorder, but it turns out they're spending hours and hours a day staring at screens. They're getting no physical activity. It used to be that seven, eight, nine-year-olds left the house first thing in the morning and came back when it got dark out. Now they never leave the house. So technological advance on the one hand, possible negative implications on the other. Um, fascinating point that I've heard at least half a dozen people tell me, including folks from the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, they can predict your health now simply knowing your zip code in the United States. Okay. It tells them what kind of community you live in. It tells them your economic status. It tells them something about your demographics. And with that, they can begin to predict what issues you'll run into with respect to health, what your long-term prognosis might be, et cetera, et cetera. It's, again, it's application of data. On the one hand, very, very positive. But what it tells you is also a little startling in terms of what we're seeing happen, happen around us. Why is all of this important? What we're suggesting, the hypothesis that I'm speaking about tonight, and I'm speaking about it with respect to the Urban Land Institute more than my, my professional work, is that many of these issues are directly or indirectly related to the built environment, the world that we have created. Um, there are some implications. In the United States, it's projected that in five years, 19% of the gross domestic product will be related to health care. The gross domestic product of the United States last year was $17 trillion, okay? 19% of that is $3.5 trillion. If we could save 1% of that, we would have billions and billions of dollars to use for other purposes. So this is a massive problem where even small incremental improvement can have a huge impact. On, on, on what happens. Um, obesity rates are rising in Europe. We all think, well, the Europeans, always slim, trim, very sophisticated, they're seeing the same problems that, that we're seeing elsewhere. Um, projected that 300, over 300 million people worldwide will have diabetes by uh, the year 2030. Air quality issues, asthma rates are up, emphysema rates are up, respiratory diseases are up, throughout Asia. I've traveled in Asia. There are days where literally you do not want to go outdoors. 
Again, that is an impact from the environment that we have, we have created. And while often these are impacts that relate to people in the lower economic brackets, many of them cut across all demographics and all economics. So these are issues that impact everyone who lives and works in a community today. Great quote from Hippocrates, walking is man's best medicine, sort of the original MD from many, many centuries ago. And I bring this up because, in fact, the U.S. Surgeon General came out at the beginning of September with a recommendation that Americans really need to walk more. Okay? That's great, you know, U.S. Surgeon General. But what's interesting is if you take the article a little further, it says, take a walk, that's the U.S. Surgeon General's prescription, but communities will have to step up, too, and make neighborhoods easier and safer for foot traffic. So even though he's saying we need to walk more, he's recognizing that that's not applicable everywhere. And that's a community design issue. He says, no worries if you can't join a gym or run a 10K. Walking is a simple, affordable way to get the needed exercise if people have a place to do it. So again, it's accessible, except sometimes it's not accessible. And that's the responsibility of my profession. How do we design communities such that the simplest thing, walking, is actually achievable? Um, and then this, this immediately followed. Within minutes of the Surgeon General releasing this, somebody on the internet put this out. It's the old cigarette logo. This product accepted it's a subdivision somewhere in a suburb. No sidewalks, no bike lanes, lots of cars. The very environment we've created for you may actually be hazardous to your health. Okay. Um, and then you have folks like, such, as, such as this group out of Copenhagen. The solution to urban diabetes is not medicine, it's urban planning. With the recognition that we can keep people active, we can keep people engaged, we can get them access to better food. Some of the issues we're talking about are not issues anymore. We're not going to solve all the problems. There's obviously important, important roles for medicine, for technology, for healthcare, for everything we'll be talking about at this conference. But there's also an important role for just the way we think about, plan, design, build, and run our communities. And that's, that's really my professional background. Um, so what is a healthy community? Healthy communities support the well-being of the people who live in them, work in them, learn in them, and visit them. In fact, that's all of us. Okay? Uh, you really, at some point, need to say to yourself, is my community supporting my well-being? Or is it actually getting in the way of my well-being? And then if you feel that it's getting in the way, you need to talk to people like me and others. And how can we work this out? How can we make this better? Um, and if you look at the list of items there, it cuts across the various forms of health. You need affordable housing. If you're worried about you can't afford where you're living, that's a stress. That's an emotional aspect. Um, safe, comfortable, and convenient transportation choices. That's an issue as well. Um, easy access to healthy foods, access to parks, access to nature. All of these are part of the component of what we mean by, by well-being. Be, well um, health promoting building materials. It turns out, I don't think any of us are surprised, that a lot of the materials that go into buildings are toxic. In some cases that's regulated, in some cases less regulated. There's a movement in the states to, to really do away with all sorts of toxic building materials, with the recognition that that will help people's health, if not immediately further down, down the road. And then to do these, make these activities, do these activities, make these available equitably across the board. It shouldn't be, well, if you're well-to-do, you have a healthy building or a healthy neighborhood. It should literally be a right of anyone as a citizen to live in a healthy, a healthy community. The Urban Land Institute, which is really the premier uh, organization for people in the real estate planning community development business decided in 2012 that this was a critical issue and that ULI was as good as anyone else in the world to tackle this issue. How do we begin to think about the relationship between our communities and our health and then what can we do to try to turn that relationship into a positive thing? Um, the mission of ULI, I'm supposed to say this every time I talk about ULI, um, it's very straightforward, I think we'd all understand. It provides leadership in the responsible use, and in create, uh, use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. That's our goal, thriving communities worldwide. Um, now, caveat here. 
the, the, the design and organization and operation of your community does have an impact on your health, but there are many other factors as well. If you look, you can see, obviously, genetics has a huge issue on your health. Your lifestyle choices. You may live in a great community, but if you smoke four packs of cigarettes a day, the odds are good you're going to have health problems somewhere down the road. So those are issues that are really beyond the control. Economic and social status, I'm not so sure a community plan can actually address that. But this issue, living in working conditions in homes and communities, that's where we come in. That's where we can think we can have a positive impact on how, how people's health uh, 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 works. So what does ULI do? It pulls together a diverse group, health and land use experts. In this case, it was a gathering in Los Angeles. The gentleman who is second on the right, the gray-haired gentleman facing you, is Dr. Richard Jackson, who was the head of the Centers for Disease Control for a number of years. And he would argue, and I've heard him say this, I read this and I said, Dick, did you actually say this? And he said, absolutely. Developers can do more to provide health care than doctors. Developers can change people's lives by what they build. Okay? And this is a doctor saying it. And he's you know, written the book, Designing Healthy Communities. So really a presence. He's now teaching at UCLA. He's no longer with the Center, Centers for Disease Control. I saw him a couple of weeks ago. So what did ULI do? ULI has a research background. We said, let's do a series of projects where we look at healthcare issues. And the Colorado Health Foundation said, we will fund that. And so a group of us looked at three communities in Colorado. Uh, Lamar is a rural community at the eastern edge of the state, about five or 6,000 people, a farm town. Arvada is a very well-to-do suburb of Denver, typical post-war suburban development. And then Westwood is a very diverse ethnic in-town neighborhood about three or four miles from downtown Denver. So three very different socio-cultural demographics, very different communities. And what we looked at were what were, the what were the health issues there, what was the relationship potentially of these issues and the built environment, and what were some steps that could be taken to take on these challenges. Three, three case studies, a lot of similarities, some distinctions, but they became the basis for ongoing work by ULI that turned into a number of publications. The first one on the left called Intersections Health and the Built Environment, sort of made the case that there is a relationship. But then the second one, 10 Principles for Building Healthy Places, laid out a framework for how you can actually improve health through community planning and urban design. And I'm gonna walk through those 10 and add on some additional elements, and then I'll end with the latest work that has come out of this, which is really a punch list of things you can look for as you look at your own communities, as you look at planning new projects, new buildings, new developments. Um, in the year later, I was the chairman of ULI Tampa Bay, and we did a similar thing for Florida. There are five councils. We each took on a challenge. Um, it might be a, a heavy traveled arterial road that nobody will walk on, nobody will ride on. It could be a poorer neighborhood with no access to healthy food. And then we published uh, the results of that as building a healthier Florida. And I, I live in Tampa. I think you saw the, uh, when I came in. So. Um, a lot of experience with that, with that project. The first and most important thing, and you think, well, of course, this is completely obvious, is put people first. Individuals are more likely to be active in a community designed around their needs. I will tell you, in the repertoire of things you think about, things that regulators look at when they approve projects and when they review projects, only very rarely does health even bubble up at all? How many cars you can move through an intersection? Absolutely. How dense the development will be? Yes. Where will the stormwater go? Absolutely. There's a litany of technical issues. Health generally is not on that list. Okay? Not on the list means you're not a key priority. Not being a key priority means they're probably going to get it wrong. So, put people first. Now, one of the things, positive things, we're starting to see are mandatory health impact assessments. Austin, Texas, for example, requires a developer submit a health impact assessment with every major project. We've all heard of environmental impact assessments. You know, will this cause pollution? Well, health impact assessment says, how is this going to impact the health of the people in your project, around your project, visiting your project? So if you design a street with no sidewalks, 
it's going to get flagged because people can't walk on that street, and that's bad for their health. And what we're starting to see in the last couple of years, more and more communities are mandating that. I can go for a walk, half a mile, and I can say, hey, guess what? You've got too many curb cuts on this street. That's bad for people's health. This, inter this interchange is designed for cars to go 40 miles an hour. That's really bad for bicyclists. I mean, you will be amazed at the number of things you see every day that when you start to dig into them are not good for your health. And then you can begin to flag those and you can look for ways to change them. So put people first, integrate health into the planning and design process right out of, right out of the box, and that's across the way. I'll show you a wonderful example. I grew up outside of New York City. This is Times Square. This picture was taken in 2003. If you've been there, you, you've seen it, you've done it. It's a fantastic place. Tall buildings, lots of neon, crazy characters, tons of energy. But in 2003, it was taking 20 or 30,000 cars a day through this intersection. Six lanes of traffic. It's where Broadway and 7th Avenue can cross each other, so it's a strange, crazy intersection. Well, when Michael Bloomberg became mayor, he said, you know, this doesn't work. This is bad for everyone. Let's take the cars out of Times Square. And that's what he did. If I could get the clicker to work. There we go. Times Square, they took the cars out, and the people immediately figured out, this is now a safe place. This is a good place. You can ride your bike. You can walk. You can hang out. And if you look at it here, it is about a year later at night. It is filled 24 hours a day. And one of the interesting things about it is you'll see on the ground, there's blue paint. The condition was people were so afraid that this was going to create traffic problems, they were only allowed to try it for a six-month test period. In six months, you don't want to make a big investment, so your urban design is painting the street, painting it blue. I was there while they were doing that. If you go there now, that was 2010. If you go there now, parts of it have been completely redone. Beautiful streetscaping, beautiful hardscape, beautiful plantings. If anything, it's become so popular that now people say it's like the Yogi Berra line. You know, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. But it's an example. The reality is, I defy you to show me a city anywhere in the world that wouldn't do better by taking cars out. The problem is people are so used to six lanes, when you say four, they say there's no way that could work. Or if they have four lanes and you say two, there's no way that can work. And almost inevitably, you take out the lanes and six months later, everyone says it's better. When the Pope visited Philadelphia last month, Philadelphia said for two days we're shutting down all the major streets in Center City. It was all about you know, the cavalcade and safety, et cetera, et cetera. People protested. Government said, forget it, Pope is here, we've got to be careful. First day, people wandered around, and they said, you know, this is actually pretty cool. This works, and now the people of Philadelphia are trying to figure out how they can close down the streets more often during the year. Okay? So, hopefully you don't have to bring the Pope back to do that, but it's, it's, all, it's all good. Um, number two, recognize economic value. Remember, the public sector may oversee a lot of the planning, the zoning, the regulations, but ultimately, it's the private sector that builds our communities. And if they can't figure out how to make some value out of a decision, they're going to fight the decision or they're going to ignore the decision. And so the challenge was, well, if you start designing, adding this additional criterion, health, what will that do to the cost of building things? What will that do to the results? What will that do to rents? And, and, and sales prices, and it turns out health is absolutely, it's the killer app in real estate. People want healthy places. The millennials, everyone between 1980 and 1995, they want to live in walkable communities. And contrary to what you hear, they don't all want to live in Brooklyn. They will go to a suburb as long as it has a little nice town center where they can walk and they can be around friends and do things with, with other people. And so it's not necessarily the big cities. They just want the walkability. They love transit. They love bicycles. They want communities that provide that for them. What we're discovering is places that are in, situ in communities like that, they stay leased up longer. They get higher rents. Their values are going up. 
During the recession in the United States, there were a number of communities, neighborhoods in the urban areas that did not decline much in value. Almost every one of them was what you would consider to be a walkable community. So there is an economic case to be made that by bringing health into the equation and letting people know about it, you actually maintain, if not improve, the economic quality of what you're working on. ULI, again, came out, published, Building for Wellness, the business case. It's a series of case studies from projects ranging from individual buildings to apartment complexes to, in the case of the Grow community, an entire new subdivision on Bainbridge Island in Washington. Heavily researched, lots of detail. All of this material, by the way, is on the ULI website. At the end, I'll give you the website contact uh, information. But again, showing to a very skeptical development community if you take this seriously, you can improve the returns you make on your, on your projects. You can improve the return on your investment. One of the other issues that is slowly crumbling in the states is the fact that the more you drive, the more money you spend, and the worse your health gets. Okay? In the period between 1970 and 2000, the amount of road miles in the U.S. doubled. The population went up 38%. More cars, more roads, not as many people, and it simply doesn't work. But what's more important is during that same period, the price people spent on transportation went from 10% of their income to 20% of their income. So it's actually costing you more now than ever to drive, as opposed to less. Everything else is going down in price, the cost of transportation is going up. Well, extrapolate, eventually this is going to end badly. And I think we're already coming. The millennials, the young people, they know that. They're already there. I show you this. This is data done by, uh, research done by Center for Neighborhood Technology in Chicago. This is where I live. This is the Tampa Bay metro area. Everything shown in yellow is housing that costs less than 30% of household income. That's the benchmark for affordable housing. If it costs less than 30%, it's considered affordable, and you can see there's a lot of yellow in that metro area. And Tampa very proudly says for one of the 20 largest metro areas in the country, we're actually very affordable. The problem is you have to add transportation to the mix. And when you add transportation costs, suddenly the entire metro area is over 45% of household income for housing and transportation. It's not affordable at all. The cost of, buy, rent, of paying the mortgage and paying for the car is bankrupting people because there's a myth that somehow if I have a house way out in the suburbs, it's cheaper for me than something that's more connected. And that is being, many, many examples of this are starting to show up. So the post-war paradigm of the auto-dominated suburb is beginning to fall apart. And the millennials are leading the way on that one as well. On the other hand, there are equal studies that say walkability creates value. It creates value if your house is in a walkable neighborhood. It creates value if your retail shop is in a walkable neighborhood. Take a walkable town center and compare it to, say, a strip on a suburban arterial. The walkable town center gets higher rents, gets higher dollar sales per square foot, and ultimately has a stronger retail population than the one on the suburban strip. So again, the paradigm from the post-war period is changing. And that's a way, because the walkability is what you're after. The economic vitality is what the developer's after. Well, they come together. They work together. You have to empower champions. And the beautiful thing about it, one of the interesting things, if you read through sort of the principles for a healthy community, and then you go get a book from 10 years ago, The Principles for a Sustainable Community, and then you go back 20 years and you get the principles for a livable community. They're the same principles. But the truth is, sustainability doesn't really resonate with people. You know, some people, but not most people. Health resonates with everyone. It's one of those universal issues that cuts across the board. However, you need to have people who are advocates for it. You, you can't just simply say, well, it's the mayor's issue or it's this developer's issue. You need advocates. And the, true, the, two, the two best advocates you can possibly find are there and waiting. One of them is young people. And by young people, I mean like eight-year-olds, okay? Because they get it. In fact, I would argue 
take a four-year-old, let him or her loose in a project, in a neighborhood, and if they can figure it out and they like it, it's probably good. And if they don't like it and they're scared and they don't want to move too far away from you, that's telling you something. It doesn't work. So that's one set of advocates. And you see a lot of them, they get involved in their school programs and, and healthy food. They get involved. I'll show you some additional examples. But then the second group are the true advocacy organizations. Cyclists are one of those groups. They are making their impact felt throughout the United States. My community, Tampa, Florida, is taking lanes out of the streets to put in the green bike lanes. Okay? People literally are writing to the city, why are they painting the street green? And then they will, they will get a response, that's a bike lane. Well, no one will ever use it. Until, of course, their children start to use it. Okay? Because I'll tell you, it doesn't, it, you can't have a good bike program if you don't provide the infrastructure for it. But once you start providing the infrastructure, people start using it. And in a couple of years, no one's even going to remember that what was four lanes is now two lanes. Because the traffic will work. It will work itself out. But you've got to build those constituencies. Uh, this is a photo from the Washington, D.C. bike share program. You're beginning to see bike share programs all over. So you don't even have to have a bike. You just need a credit card. And you can ride around. And you really begin to see, watch. You'll drive by and there are 15 bike racks and only two bikes left because 13 of them are out riding around. That's how you get people engaged. Start young. Okay? What a lot of communities have decided is not only are buses expensive, because what a bus, school bus system is, is a, it's a replica of your mass transit system. You as a community are now providing two transit systems, one for everyday people and one for school children. So what a lot of communities are doing is moving back towards, what these are called the walking school buses. Parents get together, they take 10 or 12 kids from the neighborhood, and they walk the mile to the school, or they ride their bikes. They've under, they have adult supervision, the children learn what works, what doesn't work, traffic safety, et cetera, et cetera. They get some exercise, they get used to it, they get closer to their communities, and you're beginning to see this bubbling up really spontaneously in many parts of the country, getting the kids engaged. because. They will tell you that the reason recycling really begins to work in the United States is because all those school kids in the 70s and 80s who were taught, put the cans here, the bottles here, well, they got it. And they went home and they shamed their parents into doing it. Well, they are now parents and they're teaching their kids to do it. So it may take a while, but get with the kids. The kids are, are your primary audience. Energize shared spaces. Okay? You want people to get out. We spend over 90% of our time indoors, okay? as we sit in a very pretty but indoor space. Um, no, we spend way too much time indoors, and people need inducements to go outdoors, and that's where good public spaces come out. Okay? And you can see, again, the example on the bottom is from Honolulu. It's a splash pad in a retail neighborhood. And so what do all the kids do? They run to go there, and so then their parents run to go there, and it generates a lot of activity. However, what is the number one public space in our cities? It's the right-of-ways. Between 40 and 50% of every city is actually the right-of-way associated with streets and roads. We have given that over to automobiles for far too long. And what we're talking about now is reclaiming part of that space. And what you're seeing, for example, and this photo here, and I'll show you an actual example, is they took out two parking spaces on street, and they turned it into essentially an outdoor cafe. You can do this permanently, or you can do this temporarily. I've seen them pop up and pop down in overnight. Okay? You give up two parking spaces and suddenly 40 diners are out on the street chatting with each other, enlivening the street, adding revenue to the adjacent restaurants, making things better. One parking space is at least a dozen bike spaces. A big problem with bikes, yes, I have a bike lane, but then I get to my destination, where do I put it? Well, you have to provide infrastructure for the bikes as well. Here you see Los Angeles has gone through a, a program that says, we will look for underutilized right-of-way, and we will work with the neighborhoods to convert it into what they think it should be. In some cases, it's these little parklets. 
In other cases, they closed the road entirely, painted it a surreal color, and made it essentially a park. Another parklet. You can see the great thing about this parklet is if you look in the far right-hand corner, there's an exercycle. So you can go and your buddy or your friend can have a coffee and you can burn a few calories. And um, I think I have one more there. And here's, you see another one of a, of a bike rack. And this is all public space that technically the citizens own that you've already paid for. So this is not a grand new park. This is just grabbing things and putting them where people are. And the difference between a street with lots of cars parked on it and a street with a lot of outdoor people doing things and talking and chatting and bikes and dogs and, is night and day. It's a better place and people know it. They inherently know it. Then there's the issue of how do you reclaim the right of way temporarily or, or temporarily in this case. Maybe you've heard of Ciclovia. It's a program that started in Bogota and Colombia back in the 1980s and every Sunday they would close seven or eight miles of major roads in the city and let it out for people to ride their bikes. Well, there are now 200 cities worldwide that have Ciclovia programs. People get to ride around the streets, the traffic is gone, people understand their city. If nothing, they're getting one day a week of exercise, they meet other people. It's a win-win-win across the way. And as I said with the folks in Philadelphia, they try it, they like it, and they say, we want more of this. So that's, that's another. Um, and this is, all right of, this is all public space that we've already paid for. Um, simplest thing is like anything in life, if you want people to do it, you have to make it easy. So the acronym, safe, accessible, fun, and easy. And the example I'm going to show you, I'll show you a couple, but this one is fantastic. This is a subway in Stockholm. And you can see the picture at the top. You have a broad stair and you have a little narrow escalator. Everybody takes the escalator. Well, a group called The Fun Project got a hold of these stairs and they turned it into a piano keyboard. So, every time you go up and down the stairs, you play a scale. If you're musically talented, you can play a lot more than a scale. You get a lot of exercise, by the way. Um, if you go and you simply Google Stockholm Piano Stairs, the YouTube video of this will come up. And this has been replicated in other parts, but this is, a, this is I think, a brilliant idea. But this is an example of making it fun, making health something that people understand, but also something that they get, get, a, get a kick out of. More importantly, it comes to architecture. The image on the left is the stairs from pretty much any office building built probably for the last 40 years. I am an architect. I like atriums and broad stairs and expansive open public spaces. But they cost money, and they don't generate necessarily much of a payback. I can't call an open grand stair a fire stair, a fire escape. I'm required by law to have a certain number of fire stairs. So what has happened is our buildings have gotten boring. All the vertical circulation is the elevator bank, which is usually front and center. And tucked in the far corners of the building are the mandatory fire stairs, which are dank. They're often not even painted. They're no fun at all. They echo. And so people don't use them. People will take the elevator one floor. Okay? All right. So this building on the right is the New York Times new headquarters building. And they said, we cannot have that. We need journalists talking to each other. And so throughout three or four stories of the building are these grand red stairs that run up from one level to another, connecting the journalists. They get used. The elevators are tucked far away in the corners. And so the people use them. We need to ask for architecture that does that. Okay? If you put the, make it accessible, people will use it and they'll benefit from it. Maybe the best example whoop, comes from Cooper Union. This is a new academic building finished about three years ago. And the main aspect of the building is a four-story stair that, as you can see, is way too wide for what it's required to handle in terms of people. The stair has become a stage for the entire building. People meet there, they hang out there, they play music there, they eat their lunches there, and they run up and down, up and down, up and down, and no one bothers to take the elevator. Okay, so you have to take this, you have to take health and make it front and center. And we will support you by finding the business case that shows your architects this can be done and you can make money. Okay? and they make infinitely nicer buildings. Well, this has now gone to the next level. 
And we're all familiar with LEAD, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Performance. Well, there is now something called the Well Building Standard. And that is taking the idea of a punch list for what is a good building, a healthy building, and essentially creating a certification process for doing it. What are some of the issues that they look at? Here you can see this, um, I'm sorry, the one on the right can't be read, but they talk about issues like vitality, energy, access to natural light, things that just make us feel better as people. And they've come up with a set of criteria for how you could actually build those into the building. And so here's a building, a new project in New York City. So what does it have? Well, all of the spaces have acoustic damping floors. So there's no acoustic noise, background noise, echoing that bothers you. Antimicrobial uh, uh, surfaces, so germs don't stay on the building. They will put elect lead lining so that electromagnetic radiation doesn't get into the building. It's very subtle. It's not the same as saying, hey, we put in a bike lane but it ultimately does have an impact. You go to a hotel, and there's a highway 100 yards away, and all night you hear <laughs> Well, that's gonna to lead to a bad night's sleep. That's impacting your health, and you're paying for that. Well, this would say, guess what, you can't do that. You cannot get our accreditation and allow that to happen. And whether it's triple glazing so that it's sounded out, but there are, they're taking this attitude towards designing much more sophisticated buildings aimed at improving the health of the people who live there and work there. Um, downtown Tampa is actually talking about doing an entire 40-acre segment exactly like that would be the first in the world. I did a little bit of work on that project. I'll report back in five years as to how it's going. But this is very much like LEED. This has taken off and people are taking it very seriously. Um, you have to ensure equitable access. Everything I've showed you, so not everything, but much of what I showed you so far, I mean, there's a cost associated with doing that. Not everybody necessarily can support that cost, but you have to ensure that this is equitably done. Um, this is a case, this is an example in the docks by Long Beach. They had some land that floods from time to time, and they said, let's make it into soccer pitches. And the 98% of the, of the year, when it's dry, people will use it. And that's what they've done. And of course, there are league games going from sunup to sundown every day of the week. People getting exercise, teams, camaraderie, et cetera, et cetera. So it has to be done equitably. It cannot be just across a single, a single aspect. It's, sorry, there's a, just, it's a data set that talks about it. Mix it up. The problem with the post-war model is we separated all the uses. You live here, you work there, you shop here, and you go have fun here. And then you had to connect them all back together, and that was the automobile. So what we've rediscovered is the mixed-use town center, the mixed-use environment, where things are live, work, and play on top of each other or side by side. When you put them close together, people will naturally walk and move among them. If you do a really good job of it, you can reduce the parking requirement. That has big issues because those are, garages are expensive. The goal for any parking structure should be it's always full. If it's only full eight to five, five days a week, you've wasted money. So you need to think about environments where you have activity at least 18 hours a day, if not 24 hours a day. And these types of projects, these are two examples from Florida, have had enormous returns on their investment. They were revolutionary 15 or 20 years ago. They're becoming much more conventional now. Statistics, Bethesda, Maryland, Germantown, Maryland, they're side by side. Bethesda is a walkable, mixed-use, integrated environment. 75% of the workers walk to lunch. Germantown is very much a suburban environment. 90% of the workers drive to lunch. That's a pure case. Same type of workers, same salary levels, same types of jobs, different physical organization, different impact, different health outcome. Direct, direct relationship. Embrace unique character. Every place is slightly different. And while I'm talking about sort of best practices, the reality is that what you might do here on the island is probably different than what somebody will do in Aspen, Colorado or in Nantucket because they're different places. But you have natural features, you have water, you have aspects of, that you need to embrace. Make them centerpieces. People are drawn to the water, they're drawn to the mountains, they're drawn to the lakesides. Make them accessible and suddenly people will take advantage and they'll walk and they'll use them and they'll build on them. Um, this is, I brought this one in, this is another ULI publication, it talks about tourism. And what part of the gist of this is, is people fly thousands of miles to go to a place that is known for something special. 
and they want it all to be special. I don't want to drive to your special beach on a road that looks like any road in any city in America. I want a special road. I want a road that says tropics and islands and water, and not a road that says strip centers. And it's building on the unique aspects because that will get people outdoors. That will get them activated. That will get them involved. And that's what people are looking for. That's where the value lies as well. The placemaking dividend, you focus on it. It becomes important. People take advantage of it. Access to nature. This is a project in Tampa. This used to be a seawall. And only in the last year did they put in a river walk. It's completed. And thousands of people use it every day because they can walk past the river. They can look across and see what's over there. People love access to water. And it gets, it's used even in the middle of the night. It has night lighting, so it's very, you know, lights up. It's very artistic. People love it. Just have to put it in, and they will. It's a case of build it, and they will come. Urban green spaces increase happiness. I think we all know that, but you have to build them. You have to provide them. And you have to do them right. Um, several examples from around the world. These are all directly accessible to, um, uh, to major centers. You can get out, and you can feel like, I can relax, I can unwind, I'm accessing nature, but my office is only a five-minute walk away. So you get the best of both worlds. That's a huge design issue. You can do it wrong, you can do it right. We can talk about that over our glass of medicinal red wine. Um, access to healthy food. That's a huge, huge issue. I think we all recognize it. The big issue, obviously, from the developer side is we don't necessarily control your diet, but we can, tr we can have some say over where you get your food and the kinds of food that you, that you eat. A um, number of ways of dealing with this. Make healthy food a destination. Market halls, farmer markets, food halls are coming back in a big way in the United States. This is the old ferry terminal in San Francisco. It has now become a produce hall, a food hall for vendors, etc. It makes over $1,200 a square foot in retail sales per year. And it's the fifth largest tourist destination in the Bay Area. It's a fantastic place. If you ever have a half an hour, go there and get lunch. It's phenomenal. Um, Make equitable access to healthy food a policy issue. We've all seen it. You go into a shop in a, a, a lower income neighborhood, you can get a lot of junk food. You go into a shop in a higher income neighborhood, fresh produce, fresh vegetables, and that's inequitable. And that has to be, and that's a policy issue. Now, but the reality is, is that the retailers can be brought along because people have to eat. Regardless of where they live, they have to eat. So there is a market there but you have to bring the retailers along with you. Local food equals economic and community development. More and more cities are coming to recognize that growing food creates jobs, it creates smart people, it helps people become more entrepreneurial, and it also becomes a source of good local produce and local food for people to eat in the neighborhoods or throughout the city. Rethink the grocery stores. The big box suburban 70,000 square foot grocery store is taking a big hit in many parts of the, of the, of the country. You see 20,000 foot stores. You see stores de dedicated only to regional produce, only to organic foods. You see stores built into the, base, uh, into the ground level of mixed use buildings. Why? Because people have to eat and if the people are moving into the cities and the people are moving into the walkable neighborhoods, the stores will follow them and you get to design a totally different paradigm, and you begin to provide that access to, to the healthy foods. Activate the community. As you're thinking about your designs, as you're thinking about your plans, as you're thinking about your policies, keep reminding yourself, what can we do that will get people active, will get people out there? Whether it's walking along a river, I personally think splash pads are the coolest thing. I don't use them, but I know they inherently draw children, and if they draw children, that means they draw the children's parents, and then the parents need to get a coffee, and suddenly they become something special. And they're relatively inexpensive to build. So think through, as you're working, what the opportunities are. I have a couple of last minutes, and then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done. So what are the themes? Complete streets. Complete streets is a US term, but it's very simple. What it means is a street needs to be designed for every potential user. Yes, that includes people in cars, but that also includes people on bikes, that includes people walking, that includes people window shopping, and that includes people who just want to sit down and watch the world go by. 
And the example you see here used to be four lanes, and they took out two, and they made it a much, much better environment for everyone involved. Complete streets. You see some additional examples from around the world. Mixed uses. Don't be afraid to stack things on top of each other or put them next to each other. Ideally, you can share parking so you get even more efficiency out of your projects. Live, work, play should all take place in close proximity, not scattered out all over the place. Accessible communal spaces. This is one of my favorite pictures. There's a big backstory to it, but this is Bryant Park in Midtown Manhattan. And you can go there at 2 o'clock on a sunny afternoon and you will see people making a great deal of money sitting in the grass, chatting with each other, even occasionally taking naps. It's a wonderful living room for Midtown Manhattan. It's a great example. We need to provide more of those. Do the job right, put them in the right place, design them properly, and people will use them and people will love them. Accessible nature. This is Tampa. We are famous for a four-mile sidewalk along the edge of the bay, and it gets a ton of use because people love it when they can get next to water or next to a natural feature. And in this case, some of the highest value real estate is immediately across the street. So you thought, you know, give people the access to the water, everyone benefits. Optimize walking and biking. You see the green lanes, you see the bike racks. You want people to bike, you have to build the infrastructure for them, but then they will, in fact, use it. The same thing applies to walking. You want people to walk, make wide sidewalks. Don't worry about the justification. People will walk on it. Too many times we say minimum standard, four feet, five feet, and then you have people walking in the street. And they say, this street is not safe, and then they don't walk. High quality civic design. Never skimp on design. You're building a park, you're building something that'll be there for 50 or 100 years. Put the little extra in, and people will know it, and they'll appreciate it. These are two examples from, from the US. Programming. I've talked a lot about hardware, but there's a software issue as well. Have farmers markets, have special events, have tournament days, have art festivals, have galleries, have uh, road races. You want people to get out, you want them to use their community. There's a programming component as well as the, the hardware component. I'm gonna end with a, a thought, okay? Obesity trends among US adults, you see that everybody's in terrible shape except for one state. That's Colorado. Colorado, they take pride in their health. They take pride in the fact they ride 100 miles on the weekend in the bike. They take pride in that this sandwich was grown two miles down the road. They, that character attracts others like that. You can create a culture of health. You have to work at it. You need a few crazy people. You need constituents. But Colorado is justifiably proud of the Colorado lifestyle. They have a physical activity and nutrition program that celebrates the fact that they're healthy. And we should all be on that wagon. We should all be doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, over a libation, I'll tell you some interesting anecdotes about that. Um, some statistics you've already heard, I've given them to you, and now I'm gonna end on this. Um, Building Healthy Places Toolkit just came out earlier this year. And what it is, is it's a punch list. It includes 21 items that as you look at projects, this is all available online. Boom, 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 boom. Are these projects addressing it? It shows how that applies to different examples. Another resource from the Urban Land Institute. Please go online, download them, study them, ask us questions because that's what we are here for. But in conclusion, the built environment is absolutely essential to health. It can have a positive or a negative impact. We can build our way to better health, not to perfect health, not for everybody, but for general people, your environment can have a positive impact on your health. Projects that actively take that on will see a, will see a premium. There's no doubt about it. Communities that take that on will see a premium. Planners, architects, real estate developers, lawyers, financiers, general members of the public, you have a role to play. You have to ask for this, you have to insist on getting the best, and you have to you know, keep people's feet to the fire, say we have to make this happen. And ultimately, we need to make the healthy choice the easy choice. We need to just say this is the way we do things, and our communities are for the better. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. There was a lot of food for thought in there, and I think it was very timely given that we're currently doing our Georgetown revitalization work with our downtown. So I just, on behalf of everyone, we, we aren't going to have Q&A now. Dr. Moore has said he will be happy to speak mm -hmm. to you all over a libation. And we're not there yet, so don't run away. Right, right. But uh, I just want to thank you for coming to the conference and for sharing this with us. We have our gift sponsored by Kirk Freeport, and we hope you enjoy it, and we'll always remember your time with us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.